Good morning, everybody. Brian Newberg here from goldenblack.com live once again at home. Uh, it's actually a good day to be inside because the uh, snowflakes out there are about the size of potato chips. Uh, that's the best analogy I can come up with, but they're big, they're wide, they have a wide radius, they're large. Uncommon weather at an uncommon time right now. So a good day to be stuck inside, at least as of right now. Um, this is your goldenblack.com daily quarantine uh, simulcast, this little, little video and audio um, thing for lack of a better term, we're doing uh, each day uh, through quarantine to perhaps give you something to process every day, maybe to keep you a little bit engaged with our website, to keep you to keep you talking, thinking about Purdue, whatever it may be. Um, it is brought to you by our friends at Follett's Purdue Bookstores, Purdue Federal Credit Union, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Charters Team Remax Ability Plus. I want to remind you once again, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant in Lafayette, as long as our longtime friends of the business, Arnie's and Bruno's, as well as the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette, all remain open for carryout orders. Um, so if you're looking for damn good food or simply to support local businesses, please keep them in mind. Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, Arnie's, Bruno's, and the Whitaker Inn. Also want to remind you too that if you're getting this video on YouTube, subscribe to our channels because when Normalcy resumes, we have tons of Purdue content. Hate the word content. I got to stop using it. Um, we have tons of Purdue stuff on there uh, when normalcy resumes. Um, so you're gonna, if you want access to that, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, we would appreciate that. With the promotional portion of today's video out of the way, um, we are scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Uh, we are struggling to come up with new and interesting topics each and every day. Um, but the fight goes on and uh, what I've picked out today is just five things that are really gonna matter um, for Purdue basketball next season. Five keys to the season, if you will. Um, five is always a good round number. So anytime you can apply five things to a topic, usually that's, uh, that brings things to a logical conclusion. Um, the five things I wrote down here in my 30 seconds of preparation for this video are first, Travion Williams. Uh, I think Purdue is heavily invested, obviously, in the junior to be big man. I think Everybody who's watched him recognizes what he's capable of at his best, but also probably recognizes that there is still a gap between what he is now and his best. And I think if this is the off season uh, where he closes that gap, <coughs> excuse me, where he closes that gap, uh, that would be a very positive development for Purdue. You've seen players over the years at Purdue take a pretty significant jump from one season to the next. Caleb Swanigan was certainly one of them. Uh, I hate making that comparison with him um, because I, I do think they are two very, very different players, two very, very, very different people. They have been compared to one another simply because of their dimensions and the nature of their games. Um, <clears throat> but I think if Williams makes the sort of jump, I think everybody thinks he's capable of from this season to the next. I think he can be a very, very high level player. Uh, Purdue is playing through him uh, at the back half of this season, recognizing him as their best chance. Uh, and I think that that is his starting point next season. He is Purdue's quote-unquote go-to guy. He is the guy who makes them go. And he is perhaps the single biggest key to their season. Uh, the second uh, topic I wrote down, and th this doesn't just apply to to any one positional bucket. It applies to everyone, Travion Williams included, decision-making. Uh, I think this is a little bit synonymous with guard play. Um, I think Purdue has to just do a better job running offense. They, a, they have to be more assertive uh, in the backcourt. They have to be more, they have to play like the experience level those guys will have now. Uh, but I think across the board, uh, Purdue was missing a certain something offensively, and that certain something encompassed a lot of elements. But I think I think decision making was certainly one of them. However, you want to define it, I always think it's kind of one of those things where you know it when you see it. Um, but this past season, Purdue wasn't a young team; it wasn't necessarily an experienced team. It did have it did lack experience at certain positions, but it just didn't play like an experienced team all the time. And I think. The number one area where that sort of thing shows up is typically in decision making. That has to get better. That should get better uh, because I think that there's going to be a lot of guys who now played a lot of basketball on this team coming back next year. They should play like more experienced players. 
I know I just said that last year's experienced players didn't necessarily play like experienced players all the time. So assuming that next year's experienced players play like experienced players, it's a mouthful, um, is a bit of an assumption, but I think it's a safe assumption. And I, I do think Purdue will be a better decision-making team next season. I think it needs to be. I think it, its guard play needs to be better. Its guard play needs to be more assertive, more aggressive. Uh, those guys need to take charge a little bit more. They need to be more physical. They need to get off of physical defense. They need to uh, just be more confident, more assertive. And I think the natural progression of time is probably going to uh, pay dividends there. Uh, competitiveness is uh, something I also wrote down. Obviously, a very, very important, um, a very, very important uh, element of basketball. I think that obviously, you know, when you go back and look at the results this season. You know, Purdue did sort of back down. Uh, that's probably a bit of a harsh term, but um, the teams that played with the most competitive swagger, if you will, uh, that's my kind of nice way of putting it. The Rutgers, the Illinois, the Penn States, Purdue didn't fare so well against those teams. And I think, you know, Purdue, as I've said a bunch of times about last year's team, lots of nice kids, lots of good people not a lot of killers. And I think that, you know, perhaps Purdue grows into that sort of, that sort of team. Purdue has won with teams before that were a lot of nice kids, not necessarily a whole lot of killers. Um, and next year's team might qualify too, because these guys aren't going to transform from a group of very, very nice kids, very, very nice people into a bunch of whatever term you want to use. Um, I do think the freshmen, can help in this regard. I do think the two kids coming out of red shirt can help in this regard because they are very much reputed to be competitors. Last week, Matt Painter seemed to express a little bit of, I don't want to say second guessing, but he, he did it. He did acknowledge the fact that by taking two guys out of the mix to red shirt them, that maybe didn't help the competitiveness in practice, which consequently could have affected the, the competitiveness in games. The other side of that coin would be if the guys who are playing need guys in practice pushing them to compete in games the way they ideally would be competing in games, then you're basically shining a spotlight on your problem. And having two more freshmen out there vying for minutes probably isn't going to fix that problem, nor would Purdue's solution last year have been getting younger as opposed to getting older. Purdue did win. We can talk about the redshirt issue all day long because there are no answers. You can argue both sides of it with equal credibility. Um, Purdue did win a lot of close games last year where you can say, hey, or Purdue did lose a lot of close games last year where you can say, hey, perhaps one more guy out there makes a difference in that game. That, that is absolutely true. You can also look at it like Purdue won a lot of close games last year too where one more freshman mistake might have cost you that game. Again, I'm getting off on a... a a little bit of a sidetrack here on the redshirt issue. Again, you can talk you can talk about it all day long and not come to any sort of answer because there is no answer. We will know the answer in 2024, just like I think we know the answer now uh, to what it would have meant had Ryan Klein been a fifth-year senior on this team. To me, as I've written a bunch of times, he is the difference between 16 and 15 and 22 and 9 uh, to me because he would have solved a lot of the issues that played this year's team. And if he'd redshirted as a freshman, does winning the pit game, does the minutes he played down the stretch of that year after Kendall Stevens left the program on a team that didn't win an NCAA tournament game that year, did, was that worth what he would have meant to this year's team? I think he is the new face of redshirt regret, but he is also the new face of, hey, you don't know until five years later. So again, we could talk until 2020, 20, 2024, about this issue without really being able to say anything definitively. I am so off track here that I apologize. Uh, that was a whole video unto itself and I need topics and I just burned a whole video on a, a rambling non-essential clause there. Um, defense, obviously a fairly obvious uh, area of importance in basketball. I think Purdue will feel the loss of Matt Harms. I think he's a very good defensive player. I think he's a very unique defensive player, and I think he completes Trayvon Williams in that sense. Uh, you'd like both players to – you'd like to have one really complete player as opposed to two players whose strengths are so starkly contrasting of one another. That was not Purdue's reality. 
Purdue will miss him defensively. I think defensively, Purdue needs Travion Williams to make a significant step defensively because he has to be on the floor a ton. The guys, we can talk about the backup five position into eternity right now because, again, we don't know what the answer is. But Purdue needs Travion Williams to be an improved defensive player. They need him to do be able to do a bit of a better job covering ball screens, stopping the dribble, being a little bit of a post a better post defender, uh, being able to hedge ball screens at times and do so without foul trouble. Um, one of Purdue's, Purdue's softest underbelly next season might be Travion Williams' foul trouble. That is going to be a glaring concern, assuming that Purdue doesn't find some sort of manna from heaven um, on the graduate transfer wire, which I would not bet on happening. Um, asking him to be a much better defensive player understanding the importance of him staying out of foul trouble, understanding that his conditioning is probably never going to get him to the place where he can play 32 minutes a game at maximum, at optimal level. Uh, That is a glaring concern, but Purdue does need him to be a better defensive player. Otherwise, I think Purdue can be okay. Um, The thing I like about next year's Purdue team, and this is going to get a little bit abstract for you here, is that there's going to be more interchangeability. I think when you throw a Brandon Newman, a Jaden Ivey, a long guard and Ethan Morton into the mix on top of perhaps you might not be better at the, at the forward position, but you might be a little bit more athletic at times, whether that's Aaron Wheeler, whether that's Mason Gillis, whether that's no Joe Eastern at times playing there. Um, that helps you in a defense that switches one through four because there may not always be that guy out there where the defense or the offense is targeting him to get him into the optimal switch. I think Mason Gillis, Eastern Wheeler, those are guys that if you get that switch, by and large, you're okay with that because all of them move fairly well. They're not all great. They're not all necessarily great defensive players. Obviously, obviously no gel Eastern is, I think, I think, I think Mason Gillis can be, uh, pretty good because he is pretty mobile for a guy with his size. But I don't know if you have the glaring um, matchups, matchup concerns in switches uh, next season as you did last season um, because of the fact that you have more interchangeability in terms of you have a lot of 6'5 type of guards uh, and whatnot. That's a little bit abstract there, but obviously you, you have no gel Eastern who's an elite defender. To me, the best on-ball defender Matt Painter's ever had. Um, a really, really, really good off-the-ball defender as well. Uh, I think you want to maximize his value defensively too. Uh, I think you want to you want to make sure that he's always on your premier uh, matchup with the who has the ball in their hands. I, I don't know if that always happened this year because Eric Hunter did a pretty good job early in the season guarding the ball. They were okay with that. They put Eastern off the ball probably more often than um, uh, more often than not. Um, but I do think next season you want to maximize the value of no Joe Eastern defensively. He is an elite defensive player, and I think you want to make sure that he is the guy leading the charge uh, when at all possible. Um, but I think Purdue can be okay defensively. Uh, they, I, I thought they were pretty good defensively this year with the exception of some certain matchups, some certain actions that, that gave them problems, typically um, typically related to three-point shooting, typically related to, which oftentimes was kind of outlier shooting. Purdue wants to protect the lane. It, it can give up threes at times, but it, it was the victim of, of some, some atypical shooting uh, at times as well. Ball screens were a little bit of an issue at times. Uh, too, but I think if Trayvon Williams improves, if Purdue gets a little bit more interchangeable in terms of its ability to switch into certain matchups, I think um, that's a step in the right direction. So that's kind of where Purdue is with things right now. Those are sort of the five things, and I might have that might have even been more than five. I don't know, but that is five things that I think really matter for Purdue basketball next season. Um, I'm running out of ideas here for these things. If anybody has a topic you want me to talk about, feel free to email me at bnewbert, N-E-U-B-E-R-T, at goldenblack.com. I'm happy to take your ideas, happy to take your suggestions. I just need stuff to talk about. And, you know, I thought I was a blowhard enough for this to be easy to just write down a word and talk every day. And it, it, I'm, it is getting a little bit more challenging than 
I anticipated it being, of course, with no sports going on. I should have fully anticipated that challenge, but I'm, uh, I guess I got a little bit arrogant with my ability to just come up with stuff. Um, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for listening. This has been your goldenblack.com daily quarantine, uh, simulcast for Wednesday. It's been brought to you by our friends, follows Purdue bookstores, Purdue federal credit union, the Sixth street dive restaurant First source bank, East end grill, um, and the Chargers team, Remax Ability Plus. Please keep in mind uh, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant in West Lafayette. Arnie's literally all over the place. Bruno's in West Lafayette and the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette. All of them remain open uh, for carryout orders. So if you're looking for damn good food or to support our local businesses, please keep them in mind. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you tomorrow.